So this is Nathan from Snap and welcome to another of our, another of our Snap XMP webinars. Today we're going to be focusing on looking at adding routing and validation to your online questionnaire or form. This is the second of three XMP webinars. In the first one we did the boring bit which was typing up the basic questionnaire. In this second webinar we'll be looking to refine the survey making the questionnaire more dynamic and interactive in terms of your content using routing and masking to guide the respondent throughout the answering process and then the final part which will be in July we'll be looking at the analysis a few key benefits to using routing and validation in your survey the big advantage to the respondent is that it skips them to the relevant areas of them or areas for them, guiding them along the way. So respondents aren't answering questions which aren't applicable to them and they're not having to manually scroll past sections. Now I use the word scroll there, I should add that the vast majority of what I'm going to be showing you today will actually also work for your paper surveys, although it does come more into play when you're inputting that paper questionnaire data back into SNAP. Validation can help to avoid respondent frustration by filtering out irrelevant choices, as well as also allowing answers to be given in a number of different formats. So if someone wants to type their telephone number with random spaces in the middle, or add a postal code with a mixture of uppercase and lowercase and no spaces, then that's fine, just let them. With clever response validation, respondents also feel more engaged with the questionnaire or form, as they can see that the questions and answers that are displayed are specific to them, taking into account any responses which they've given so far. And then the big advantage for you, the researcher, is that the data you collect is clean, relevant and ready to analyse. So respondents aren't able to give a reply that is wrong. They aren't able to answer questions, answer questions which they shouldn't be, or tick answers that don't align themselves with previously given answers. And despite allowing them to give varying response formats, SNAP will tidy up that data in the background, providing you with a consistent format ready to analyse. So in short, you get better response rates and better data. OK, let's head into the software to make a start. So we're going to be logging into um, Snap XMP online. Um, I'm going to be using the UK server today. And I'm just going to be using a sort of a demo account um, called videos. And I'm going to be heading into my webinars folder. And I'm just going to sort of give you a bit of a preview of what we're going to be sort of aiming for today. Um, now, I should say that um, before we sort of go into this survey, there are a couple of questions which have perhaps been a little bit sort of shoehorned into this questionnaire just to sort of demo um, some of the things that I wanted to show you today. Ideally, I'd maybe sort of, um, sort of pop into a few different surveys and show you in sort of different formats and things, but that would obviously type, take additional time. So we're going to go straight into the evaluation um, course evaluation survey and I said this is just a, a preview demo at the moment. If I go to the collect tab and I'm going to go straight down to the preview. It is just a preview so that the data won't sort of count towards anything and if I just fly through the survey a second so a number of things happening so we've got a date question which Will allow me to put dates in there but if I attempt to put a date in there which is after today so people can't say that they attended some training tomorrow because it, it I put some validation in there so I can only put a date in which is either equal to today or a date in the in the past we've got some must answer questions in here so some compulsory questions so I need to give some answers to those Here you can see a moment ago I chose the publisher course and the data from there has been input into one of my sort of follow up questions. Got some drag and drop questions. Which um, we input um, in the last webinar, so this is really just um, the, the survey that we started typing up in the, the previous webinar. Etc. Et some carousel questions. Um, in the last webinar, we looked at adding this type of question, this sort of drag and drop question, which was sort of 
rank the sort of top three and it doesn't let you choose any more. Um, obviously, sometimes you might decide that actually drag and drop style questions might not be for you. So today we're going to look at how we can do a similar sort of thing, but in a more standardised sort of grid style question. So pick out three most important factors to you. So I might say that the first and most important is the fact that courses are run face to face or sorry, run online. In fact, I might then say that second might be to do with the course content. And then I might sort of forget that I've chosen number two already, my second, and say, well, also it's to do with the um, graphical location. But when I try and choose a, a second one to be the second, you can see it doesn't let me. So I need to turn that to my third option. So different ways of essentially achieving the same result, one using a more traditional style question. Here we're asking people to give some quantity response questions. So this is a, a numerical question, but we're actually looking for um, a currency. So it will accept a value of, but I've set a, a sort of valid range, so that's actually outside the valid range. So it would accept a value of this equally. If someone puts a pound sign in there, it will accept that as well. We've got how many um, classes did you take this term last term? So I can type uh, a numerical value in there. I can also type in a word. And it will accept that and you can see it's also adding up the, the two at the bottom. And again, it doesn't matter whether I put a capital F in there or not, it's going to accept both. So a lot of this is all to do with making the experience for the end user um, a more sort of pleasant experience. For this question, we're asking people how should um, sort of in crowd invest in um, in the business. So I might choose a number of different categories. So if I choose maybe air conditioning, evening courses, uh, perhaps parking. And you can see below I've got a number of follow up questions. Now, ideally, I might consider putting these um, with sort of page breaks. So these appear on different pages. But again, just for the benefit of showing you today, I put them all together. And you can see it's asking me to choose the first most important. So I could say air conditioning. As I do that, you can see air conditioning disappears from the second option. If I then choose parking, parking then choose and disappears from the, um, the third option. In fact, actually, it doesn't then give me a, an option to say what's my third option, because actually it's fairly obvious that it must be evening classes. If, however, I was just to reset the page and just choose one option, then actually it doesn't ask me to say which is the, the most important to me because clearly it is only course books. If I now go and choose maybe four options, I will see all three questions. And as I choose one, each of those options are disappearing from below. So the options available depend on what I've already selected. And as I said, if perhaps I've only got three in the first place, I don't need to answer that third question. We've got some routing on display here. Now, again, we might consider some page breaks here, but just for the benefit today, if they say yes, they go on and answer the demographic questions. If they say no, all the demographic questions disappear. Just sticking with the demographic questions. Um, I choose some different options. If I choose, I describe myself in another way. An extra question pops up so I can add some text in there. If I don't choose that option, it's not available. We've got the postcode question or if you're outside the UK listening in, sort of the equivalent of the zip code um, or postal area. So in the UK, a postal code postcode normally is sort of two capital letters or one capital letter followed by number followed by space, followed by number, followed by two more capital letters. But again, in the interest of not frustrating your respondents, it really doesn't matter if they don't put a gap in the middle. And if they want to do a real mix of uppercase and lowercase, as long as they've written everything in the right order, Snap will fix the rest for you. Same with the email address. That's a valid email address. However, if I was to remove the at symbol, and try and move on, it stops me. Equally, if I was to get rid of the .com or something at the end, again, it wouldn't be happy with that. So 
some of these things on display are to make sure that you get the valid data that you want back. Other things are really to stop you annoying your respondents by letting them do what they want to do and you kind of fixing it in the background. OK, if I close that preview down. And I'm going to head back into my webinars folder. And we go back into the survey which we started creating in the previous webinar last month. We go into the build tab. And today we're going to start off by looking at routing. Now you may well know this as skip logic, but either way it's, it allows us to state which questions are going to be shown during the answering process. So it may well be that you've got a really big survey, perhaps 50, 60 questions, but actually depending on how people respond, the majority of respondents only perhaps see sort of 10 or 15 questions and the other sort of 35 questions or so sort of the main hidden. So we're going to start off by applying some routing to the demographic section. And we're going to say if they click yes, go to question 20. If they click no, they're going to skip down to question 24. Now, personally, when I'm doing routing, the first thing I do is pop into the paper survey. So the paper edition in the background. Um, the benefit of that is a couple of things. One is that um, You've got the question numbers next to each each question. Now you have got ultimately the questions in the sort of blue handle, but the other benefit is that your paper survey tends to be a little bit more compact because it probably doesn't contain quite as many images. Certainly wouldn't it contain all the sort of interactive question styles. So ultimately you can just see a little bit more on the page at any one time. But oh, anything to do with functionality affects all the different versions running in the background anyway. So if I click on question 19, and on the left hand side we have routing. Got three different types of routing. Ask this question if, ask this choice, and um, after this choice go to, and after this question go to. So we're going to look at all three today. But we're going to say if they click yes, go somewhere. If they click no, go somewhere completely different. So we're saying after this choice, if I click on the edit icon. And we're saying if they click yes, go to question 20. If they click no, go to question 24. And simple as that. And again, because it's a paper survey, we've got the text on display. Whilst in a moment, when I pop back into the web survey, you'll see that that text is hidden in the background. So again, just another benefit for doing this on the paper survey. Looking at question 21, I'll just show you this one a moment ago. So at the moment we've got this please add here is actually going to appear dynamically next to the I describe myself in another way. At the moment it will appear there at all times where really we only need it to appear if they choose this option. So we're going to say this is question 21, this is question 21a. So we only want question 21a to appear if they tick that option. So ask this question if and said the routing's on 21A. So if the response to question 21, which was the original tick box question, was option number five. So it's based on the sort of tick boxes. So I describe myself in another way as option number five. And again, we're only applying that to the, this part of the question. Now we have got another type of routing uh, called after this question go to. Now, I don't really have a sensible example of that one to show you today, but let's take an example where moving back to the age question above. It might be that after that question, regardless of how they respond, so it really doesn't matter whether they're under 18 or 55 plus, but regardless of that, question 21 is no longer relevant to them. So it would be a case of clicking on question 20, clicking on after this question go to, and again, you can just drop down where you want to send them to. So it may well be that you send them off to a kind of thank you message at the end. It may well be just jumping them to a, a, a completely different section, but either way, I can choose where I want them to go. What we can also do is add some additional routing in there as well, some additional expressions. So it could be, yes, they will go to question number 24, no matter what they do here, but only if they've also perhaps chosen the second option, question one, or, they perhaps chosen the second option in question number nine. 
So it allows you to sort of combine a little bit of jumping forward, but under certain conditions as well. But I'm actually going to close all that down. And at the end of today, I'm actually going to point you off to um, a webinar we did a little while ago, which will sort of focus on a few more sort of, of those advanced sort of settings of so sort of the um, the routing expressions which you you might make use of. OK, so we've added some fairly standard sort of routing to the survey. I just say what I've done and what we're now going to turn our focus on to is validation and masking. So if I click around the bottom on validation and masking, we've got a number of different options available. And if I was to go and click on a, an open ended style question, got one right at the top. You can see these options on the left will change, so the options will depend what kind of question that you're clicked on. Now I'm actually going to pop back into the PC version, PC laptop version mainly just to remind you kind of what these questions are going to look like in a, an online sort of scenario but as i said ultimately anything to do with functionality it really doesn't matter which edition you're in because functionality goes across all different versions or all different editions of the survey okay so we're going to work our way down the survey looking at some of the functionality starting off with my date question and under the valid we could set a range. So it could be things like I only want people to be able to type in a date that starts maybe the 1st of January and runs to the, don't know, the 31st of May 2023. Um, that's quite a specific date range. Um, and the danger is I end up sort of extending my survey into June and forgetting to change this. So today I'm actually going to make use of the word today. Now that would mean that they can only type in today's date. So we could also say less than today. So they can type in any day which is basically in the past. Or if we add an equals in there, it will be any day, including today and the past, but certainly not the future. Okay, so that's question number one. Coming down to question number two, just going to make that a mandatory or a must answer question. In fact, whilst I'm here, I'm going to do exactly the same for question number four. Now, you may well think that all your questions are quite interesting and quite important. Um, I can assure you that no one else does. So just bear in mind, although you may think it's a good idea to make all your questions must answer, again, you're probably going to be frustrating your respondents. So really, it's just trying to stick to one or two really important questions, which if they're not completed, the survey is not really going to work. It's better to get some data back rather than frustrating people and them having them sort of given up because they've uh, got halfway through and got frustrated with with the way the survey is running. Now, whilst we're on question four, we're going to do a few additional things. So at the moment, these are all in sort of alphabetical order. Let's take an example where this is a live survey. It's already sort of ongoing, but you suddenly have introduced a new training course. So I'm going to introduce Excel. You'd want to ideally keep these alphabetical, so I'd ideally put it between a um, the, the first one and the second one. But when we did our routing a moment ago, you saw that a lot of things in Snap are based on the position. So at the moment, Internet browsers is position two. If I was to add Excel in the middle of access and Internet browsers, then Internet browsers is going to become number three. So it's potentially going to have a knock on effect to your routing, maybe have a knock on effect to any tables and charts and filtering that you've got going on in your reports. So I'm actually going to add it at the end. But that's obviously a bit strange having none of these in an Excel at the end. So under ordering, I'm going to set that to alphabetic, alphabetic, which means that when it's actually visible for the sort of end user, it will all be in the right order or, or alphabetically at least. Just bearing in mind we've got none of these which is option number seven, I want to exclude number seven from the alphabetical list. So that will always appear at the bottom. OK, so this question, question four was which training course did you come on today or last time you attended training? Moving down, I've got a couple of sort of subheaders. I'm going to take the text from question four, so the answer effectively, and insert it into a sort of follow on question or as I said in my case a follow on um, instruction. So we have the tag icon, the sort of insert verbal icon. So I'm going to take question number four 
and it's the reply. We could force it into uppercase or lowercase if you wanted to, but I'm going to leave it as it is. So I'm going to make it bold just whilst I'm here. What we do just need to bear in mind, though, is that I've got um, my question four was which training course did you come on? One of which was none of these. That's going to read a little bit strange saying, please rate the following aspect of your none of these training courses. So I've got two statements. That statement we're going to make pop up if they tick none of these. And this statement is going to pop up if they choose one of the actual courses. So again, if I go into my routing, we're going to say, ask this question. So if the response to question four was number seven, which was none of these. And for the next one, again, we're going to ask this question, but this time if the response was option number one to six or Excel, which we just added, which was number eight. Now I've done this via routing today. Again, what we could have done instead, but would have taken a little bit longer to set up, would have been to, if they tick none of these, perhaps have an open box, which would allow them to type in which course it was. And then again, that text could be inserted in here instead. But keeping it simple, we're going to move down to question 11. OK, so if you remember, this was um, where we're asking people to choose um, three or all the three most important things to them, putting them in order, which was the equivalent of this sort of drag and drop way of doing it. But really simply, if I go back into validation and masking. We can just tick making check. What we might also want to do is randomize this list of options because at the moment course content is always going to be at the top so sometimes people are going to be a bit lazy they're going to see course content and it's the first thing they get to oh, that will do is my number one that will do is my number two um, particularly if these were sort of rating scale questions and you had maybe 10 or 15 by the time they get down to the third or fourth one they're going to be quite bored of answering your rating scale questions so it just gives an e equal opportunity of all these options to be somewhere near the top Okay, so yes, we will randomize that list. Going down to question 13. So this is a quantity response question. I'm going to do a couple of things here. First of all, I'm going to set a sort of a, a range that they can type. So they can type anything from zero, as in they don't have a spending a training budget at all, all the way up to 10,000, um, in my case, pounds. But as I said, what we will allow them to do is an a, a currency sort of value they potentially might put a pound sign in there so we've got some currency options down here i'm going to do currency uk today but you can see there's us there's europe and there's also one which covers all all three of the sort of different currencies but we'll go uk today what we could do is also tie that in with how many characters they can type so my Top value, so 10,000 with sort of two decimal places. In fact, let's add those in. Will be eight characters long, but there is the potential for that pound sign, so up to nine characters. And probably should just add, you can, for an open ended comment question, we could also add a maximum data length if we wanted. Personally, I wouldn't for a general comment question because if you've got quite a, an upset customer, telling you why they're upset and you suddenly cut them off halfway through them having a sort of a rant at you, you're really not going to be making them feel any better. So I would leave the max length for where you've got quite specific information. Or maybe you're looking for maybe one or two words. Coming down to question 14. Um, so this is sort of three separate questions. We've got 14 A, B and C. So the first thing I'm going to do is make these um, specify that they can type in zero to 10. What I'm also going to do is allow them to type words. So if they want to write the word three, they can do, or if they want to write the number three, they can do. What we also just need to bear in mind if they're going to potentially be writing words, so the word three, for example, has five characters long. For the second one, 
it's already got the small wooded integer, but we can potentially put a different limit on here, but it doesn't make any sense to have a different limit, so we'll leave it as 0 to 10 again. And then for the third one, what we're actually going to do is allow, allow Snap to calculate what these two add up to. So if we take, so first of all, the maximum it can add up is to 20 because those would go up to a maximum of 10 each. And then in the initial value, we can say, take question 14a, in fact, you can see I've got it already because I was practicing, but question 14a and add it to question 14b. So it will actually do some calculations for you and display that as a result. The read only is currently set to no. That means that they could over type it if they wanted to. So I'm going to set it to read only yes, so they cannot edit that. OK, coming down to question 15. So this was the question where we were asking people to specify how we might like um, the company to invest or what we might like the company to invest them over the next sort of 18 months. And a list of um, sort of 15 categories that then we're asking sort of follow up questions of, OK, so you've chosen five or six, but what should we invest in first? What should we invest in second, etc.? So first of all, the order of the first list has to also be this order of the second list and the third list and the fourth list. Um, and that's when I say order, that's the order that they're actually in snap. It doesn't matter how they're displayed, because as we talked about earlier, we might like to randomize these. Um, again, realistically, yes, you might like to randomize this question, but actually I've got three very similar ones. So I'd actually like those to all appear next to each other. So I'm not going to randomize it this time. Equally, tick order apply in a question like this, you may well have a sort of a none of these or none of the above underneath. So you don't want someone ticking you know, um, air conditioning, evening courses, goodie bags and none of these. So that's where mutually exclusive comes in. So if none of these was at the bottom, I could tick none of these. And then when they're filling it in, if they do choose five or six and then none, Ticking none will basically undo the fact that they've already chosen those previous five. Um, so we ignore the randomization and the fact that we haven't got a none there. But what we're going to do is specify that if they choose three or four options here, those will be the three or four options underneath that they can then choose. So they can't say that parking should be their number one focus if they didn't initially say it in question 15. If I click on question 16 and we're making use of mask. Okay, I've actually got it here already from earlier. So whatever options were chosen in question 15 will be displayed in question 16. Now we've also got the additional option to make it an auto answer question, which basically means if there's one answer left, there isn't really a need to ask that question. So, for example, if I said the only thing I, I'm interested in you investing in, investing in is evening classes, evening classes will be the only option available on this list. You really don't need to ask that question because clearly it's the only thing that you want us to look at. So it will actually skip over question 16 and they won't actually need to ask it. So working a little bit like routing, but the additional auto answer means that it will actually appear in your analysis as well. So that was what was the first item. Then we want what's the second most important thing that we want um, that you want us to invest in. So again, we only want it to be made up of the stuff which was initially chosen in question 15, but we don't want someone saying that the air conditioning should be the first favorite, or sorry, the first most important and the second most important. So we don't want what was mentioned in question 16. So this list will be made up of the initial list from question, the initial list of things which were chosen in question 15, but whatever they chose in question 16 then be removed. And again, we will auto answer it. And then just one more, which is going to just be sort of adding on again. So again, it starts off with the initial stuff which was mentioned in question 15, but this time we want to remove anything which was mentioned in question 16 or Question 17. Again, auto answer. 
And because we have auto answer on, for a lot of people, it may well be that they answer question 15. Maybe they see question 16, but maybe 17 and 18 are auto answered. So they may well skip from 15 or 16 straight to question 17. OK, just a couple more to finish off on. We have the postcode question. So I said zip code um, for um, postal area, depending on where you're in the world you're living. So it's currently just set to a literal response, but we're going to set that to postcode UK. And I said there's also zip codes in there as well. And the key benefit to you is you will only get valid postcodes coming back. And the key benefit to the person filling in the survey is if they want to do it in uppercase or lowercase, it will let them do it and the data will be fixed in the background. Same with email address. Go. Just to finish off, if I pop into questionnaire properties down the bottom, that I will just save before we do anything. Here we've got some options such as which questions, which navigational button, sorry, will appear at the bottom. So do you want the save button, submit button, etc. But also when do you want those to appear? So yes, you could turn off the back button if you wanted. You could, if you really wanted to, put the submit button on every page if you wanted. Generally, I'd say you probably leave those as they are. For the submit URL, there's options to specify where the respondent will be directed after they press submit. So you could direct them off to your home page of your website, or perhaps you might create your own thank you page on your website. If you were to leave it blank, it, the respondents will be directed to our standard thank you page. OK, so hopefully that's shown you just how easy it is to add routing and validation to your questionnaires and forms. It's not something that you have to do, but obviously, and obviously it does add time onto the sort of questionnaire design stage, but it certainly is advisable and you will end up um, will end up providing you with data that's ready to analyse and hopefully will give you better response rates and ideally happier respondents. As mentioned, this was the second of three webinars relating to our online on our online software. In July, we'll be looking at the options available to analyze your data. On screen now, there are a couple of QR codes. The first one on the left will direct you to a webinar we did a little while ago, which will take you through some different types of expressions that can be used within your routing. So that might be useful for some of your more sort of complex projects. The middle QR code will take you onto our support hub and actually straight to the page on validation. And then if you've got a spare two minutes, I'd be very grateful if you wouldn't mind taking our short survey, uh, just asking you what you thought about today's webinar. So that's the QR code on the right. Thank you for joining me and we'll hopefully see you again soon.